Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network or the EBM Tools Network, which is co-coordinated by Octo and NatureServe. And I also with me today is Ray Evrard, who is also with Octo and is a project manager for Open Channels. Um, we are so excited today to have Peter Hawthorne from the University of Minnesota and the Natural Capital Project here today to talk about using ROOT uh, for ecosystem service optimization analysis. ROOT is the restoration opportunities optimization tool. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know how to ask questions. We're first gonna have a presentation from Peter and then we should have ample time for questions. Um, you can ask questions one of two ways. You can raise your virtual hand, there's a little hand icon in the user interface and I'll unmute you. Uh, or you can type your question into the question and answer panel or the chat panel. Um, also, for those of you used to our, our old webinars on GoToWebinar, um, this chat is a little different. That in this chat, you are allowed to chat with other participants. Uh, we just ask that you use discretion when using this, and if you have anything, just sort of keep it to the topic of root and ecosystem services. Um, well, thank you very much, Peter, for coming today. Uh, we had tons of interest in this, and we're very excited to hear what you have to say. So I'm going to turn it over to you now. Cool. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, excited to talk to you about Root. Root's a new software tool that we developed, the Natural Capital Project, um, in partnership with IUCN. Um, and it's you know, one of our first tools that's putting optimization of ecosystem services um, sort of at the front of what its, what its intention is. So when we think about ecosystem services, this is, you know, in, a, in addition to a traditional conservation approach that's focused on habitat, um, where we also start to think about what are the benefits that that habitat and nature in general provide to people. Um, and so there are clearly, you know, a, a nearly innumerable number of ways that, that nature provides benefits. Um, but this is the approach that we take with ecosystem services to think about the delivery of these different um, these benefits. So in any particular um, project or implementation, there will be a number of activities that will be considered um, to improve the delivery of these services to people. Um, so, uh, you know, in a, in a landscape management, and I was thinking about how can forests be brought into a landscape in order to improve, both improve uh, the service delivery to people habitat and carbon sequestration. And there are a number of different you know, options that are on the table in any project. Um, and the, the question is always, uh, where should those activities be targeted so that they're cost effective, um, environmentally beneficial and delivering ecosystem services. But this is obviously uh, ends up being a very difficult question to answer with a lot of complications. Uh, so one of the I'll call it the traditional ways that this question has been answered and addressed in a, in a decision making context is through uh, sort of like a, a scenario to evaluation to deliberation approach. Um, and if, if anybody's familiar with the invest models that are developed by Natural Capital Project also, the typical way this might be implemented is to consider various scenarios of uh, future land use or uh, future biophysical drivers. Those are put into to GIS data modeled with INVEST to look at things like water yield or coastal protection. Um, that produces a set of outputs corresponding to each of those scenarios. And then um, stakeholders will ideally look at the uh, combination of services that each of those scenarios provides. And then there can be you know, a circle of deliberation but generally, it, it, the, the process flows from scenarios to evaluation. Um, an optimization approach comes at it maybe from the opposite direction, where we think about describing the values or the objectives of the decision first, and then using optimization to produce a suite of scenarios that meets those objectives. So some, some questions that might the framing and suggest an optimization approach are, say, what's the best achievable ecosystem service value? 
given a budget constraint or sort of the, the flip version of that question is um, if there's a, an environmental target in place, what's the least cost way to meet that target? So as a sort of simple example here, um, this is some work from Christina Kennedy um, at Nature Conservancy. And the question is, let's just say we have a certain amount of habitat that we want to have on a landscape. How could we optimize it, say for uh, biodiversity on the top? And there we have a landscape where the, the green parts are very compact and connected. And it provides a good habitat outcomes. Where on the other hand, if we optimize for water quality, you see we're putting in lots of riparian buffers and really protecting uh, all of the points where pollution might flow and enter streams. Um, these, are, these are both outcomes that have been targeted towards a particular ecosystem service. But it's of course very rare that we would actually want to optimize for just a single service on a landscape. So um, an optimization approach needs to be able to consider, you know, in order to be uh, relevant to most decisions, needs to consider multiple objectives. Um, and so we, we typically are using optimization to build sort of something like uh, what could be called a trade-off curve or a Pareto curve or an efficiency frontier, uh, depending on what discipline you come from. But the general idea is that you want to identify all of the different ways where you can achieve different combinations of one outcome, one beneficial outcome versus another. Um, so this is a, an example with just two objectives. Again, trying to keep it sort of simple here. Um, on the x-axis, it's the number of dollars of economic activity from this landscape. And on the y-axis, the expected number of species that could be supported given that landscape. And the, the point I here represents the current landscape. And one of the things that this approach reveals are all of these points to the upper right of I that offer win-win sorts of shifts from the current landscape where we're both improving um, economic activity and the number of species. And the, the thing that makes this a Pareto frontier is that once you get to the, the, the outside of the curve, um, it's not possible to increase one service without decreasing the other. So these, uh, this curve shows what is the sort of theoretical limits and trade-offs between um, improvements to each of the different services. Um, so I just want to highlight a couple of values and limitations of the optimization approach before diving into how Root addresses it. Um, I think it's important to have these out front and we can talk about them later in the QA. Um, some of the values are that just be by nature the fact that it's often driven by the computer, it can be very comprehensive. You can generate thousands and thousands of scenarios, which can be hard to do in a, in a more traditional by hand process. Um, because you're doing optimization, you can immediately see whether there are win-wins or in some cases there may be fundamental constraints. The landscape is already at say, its economic uh, optimum. This is maybe be the case for uh, agriculture in the Midwest. Um, but that can be useful information in decision process too. Um, spatial data can be really complicated. Once you start moving in multiple objectives, it's, it's very hard to make sense of it without some kind of um, visualization or computational support. So this helps there. Um, and even if these landscapes aren't feasible to reach in any real sense, um, it can set aspirational goals that a policy uh, or project could work towards. So some limitations when we're thinking about using optimization is not to be, not to treat it as uh, overly prescriptive because it can be seen as too top down in decision-making processes where we're often trying to you know, bring in a diversity of stakeholders, reflect variability and preferences um, and have a, a more back and forth kind of process. So it's important to, to make sure that optimization isn't seen as the, the perfect technical solution. Uh, particularly because of the second point, um, it, it can be hard to frame more practical uh, policy or uh, kind of landowner willingness to participate 
uh, within an optimization. So sometimes the, the outcomes don't perfectly match with what's, with what's feasible. And even though this is being done by the computer, the more objectives that are added, the more complicated the process can be. And sometimes it reaches the point where it's not actually uh, solvable. But the general thing that we wanted to do here with Root was to uh, actually make doing this approach and generating trade-off curves and corresponding maps uh, feasible and approachable as part of an ecosystem service analysis. So here's a screenshot of Root. And if you've used any of the invest models, the way that this is set up will be very familiar to you. So I wanted to jump in with the this example, um, which is agricultural management in Costa Rica. This is where we really co-developed a tool with IUCN. Um, and I know it was noted in the email, uh, Root currently has not been used in a marine setting. So my, my main example here is terrestrial, um, but I, I think the, the same approach translates just as well to the questions about where you would be doing things either on the coast or um, in, in the ocean. So um, I do have an example at the end that is more marine focused. So when we're thinking about framing a problem and considering whether to use root, there are just a couple of things to think about. Um, what are the environmental metrics or the ecosystem services that we're interested in? Who are the stakeholders or beneficiaries um, or other endpoints? It could be infrastructure or habitat types. Um, where are those on the landscape? And then what are the activities or interventions that we might be considering that we want to model? Um, so in this particular example, the thing, things we were looking to achieve were improvements in water quality, improvements in habitat, uh, poverty alleviation, carbon sequestration, and you know, several others. Stakeholders were uh, water treatment plants or municip municipal water intakes. Um, critical protection areas that were identified by the Costa Rica conservation groups, um, rural populations. And then the activities and interventions that we were considering were various forms of uh, changes to agricultural management, um, reforestation, and some sort of mixed use agroforestry. And so what we do is gather all of that data, apply a route, and then it will generate a suite of um, landscapes where these different activities are uh, distributed that meet some other criteria that we set forth. So diving into the root part of that box, um, this is basically what root is going to give you uh, on this one slide. You'll have a set of spatial inputs that you know, correspond to potential ecosystem service benefits of each of your services. Um, shape files that um, we, we think of the, uh, the term service sheds, if you're familiar with that term, uh, but essentially indicate where are spots in the, in the land or marine management area where a certain biophysical change is more or less important for delivering a service. Um, and then what we call the spatial decision unit map, which is indicating um, of all, which are the some units of the landscape that represent uh, potential individual yes or no decisions for implementing an activity. So that will all be sort of typical GIS data, um, rasters and shape files that will be come in from um, a, an ecosystem service model like INVEST. Um, you'll then define a problem in terms of the objectives and constraints. Um, and then Root has a couple different uh, operation mode, so you can decide to do a, sort of a random Monte Carlo analysis or a more structured kind of uh, approach. And then Root will generate this pool of optimized solutions and, and trade-off curves. So over on the, the right, you can see a trade-off that was generated between nitrogen and sediment reduction and what we call the agreement map, which is highlighting where on the landscape the decisions are either the same or different across this frontier. So it's a way of trying to understand um, if there are places where you definitely want to put an activity or definitely don't, or where you really need to make a, a 
a decision that's based upon these, these priorities. And I'll come back and explain that again um, at the end of walking through the process of using Root. So this example, um, we're working with IUCN in Costa Rica, it's part of their work um, in the bond challenge, which is to uh, restore millions of hectares internationally. Um, and it's, it's combining the goals of reforestation for habitat with reforestation for uh, carbon sequestration and uh, providing ecosystem services to each of the implementing countries. Um, so within that context, we're of course thinking about what is the, the ecosystem service delivery that we could achieve through these different reforestation activities. Um, so when we approach that problem in root, we're gonna first do the, the pre-processing that's gonna take that spatial data and prepare it for the optimization. And there are just a couple inputs to walk through here. Um, first thing we need to define is this activity mask, which is a, a raster that identifies where on the landscape is a potential site for the different activities that we might be implementing. Um, so some examples of that that we looked at in Costa Rica were, where are they growing coffee? Um, and these are all sites where we could consider implementing different fertilizer management or switching to shade grown coffee. Um, and where are their pastures? And these are locations for switching to some sort of integrated civil pastoral system or restoring and uh, or intensifying as a sort of trade-off between, uh, I guess, an extensification or intensification trade-off. So these are both examples of those activity masks for particular activities. Next thing we do is define this decision space. Root doesn't optimize at the pixel level. It requires you to specify these slightly larger um, aggregated spatial decision units. If you don't have anything particularly in mind, it can generate a regular grid of either hexagons or squares of, a, of a, an area that the user can specify. Um, or you can provide a custom shape file. Um, in this case, this is a map of watersheds, but you could have pre-delineated potential project outlines. Um, as an example, I guess any other shape file that you can think of that would be relevant. Um, and then what Root will do is overlay those activity masks with the, the spatial decision unit to get a potential implementation area per uh, decision unit. Then the outcome of the root analysis at the end will be specifying what fraction of each of these uh, SDUs should receive the, the activities of interest. Then you generate these impact potential rasters or sometimes we call them marginal value rasters. And these are just specifying if you do a certain activity in, in this location, what will be the, the biophysical change that you'd expect for the service of interest? So here are maps for uh, nutrient loading to streams. These we're calculating using the invest tools, um, but any tool that you can use to generate um, rasters that estimate marginal values it, uh, also work. Root does not depend on using invest for the, the service modeling. Um, and within the ecosystem service framing, there's the biophysical change, like the amount of nitrogen reaching a stream, but we also need to think about how does that, that biophysical quantity uh, flow through some sort of transport process to, um, so it's coming out of biophysical models, to impact beneficiaries. And we only actually get a, a value in the ecosystem service framing if that, uh, the biophysical change reaches some sort of beneficiaries or if the people come to the area where that change has taken place. So that's where we think about this idea of a, of a service shed, which is the, the area of a landscape that is providing more value for a particular uh, biophysical change. So this image uh, is an example of a pollination service shed. Each of these uh, bee habitats is able to provide the pollination service to the certain area of these farms. Um, you can think of this as being fairly analogous to the idea of a watershed, um, but for, uh, for the, the transportation process relevant to a different service. So some examples of service sheds that we used in this, this analysis were um, the catchments for 
major hydropower dams. And here we're thinking about uh, reducing the sediment that gets into those reservoirs. There were a number of uh, uh, objectives that involved improving drinking water. Some of them were catchments for municipal intakes. Um, others were about improving surface water for areas where people are, are just taking water out of streams directly. So we're thinking about the maps show the number of people in that, in that area that are drinking untreated surface water. Um, and then we had a couple of biodiversity focused um, service sheds. This is identifying where there were uh, mostly coastal wetlands where we're trying to prevent um, habitat degradation. And then we had another map um, of critical conservation and corridor areas that was focused more at the forest restoration side. Putting all of that data into root is, I guess, uh, I would say as simple as filling out a couple of tables. So you have one table. So here's here's the folder on the computer down in the lower right. And you, to do the pre-processing, you need to create one table that points to the different rasters that represent the biophysical changes and the marginal values. Um, and then you make another table that points to the service sheds, uh, the shape files that are using to provide spatial weighting. And the, the addition here is that um, you know, shape files contain multiple fields that have attributes attached to each of the polygons. So you need to tell root which are the attributes of interest that describe the, the factor that should be used to weight the value of the, the marginal values. So for the hydropower, I'm um, interested in the depth of the reservoir or the capacity, the electrical generating capacity of that dam. Um, for surface water, I'd be interested just in the total number of people in that polygon or the impairment rate or, or risk of that stream. Um, and then finally, there's a table that specifies which of the, the spatial weights correspond with which of the biophysical rasters. So for, for the sediment and hydropower relation, we want to multiply this um, S export, the sediment export quantity from each pixel by the, the capacity of the hydropower dam that it's feeding into. So this will be our combined weight term. Uh, but you can multiply many, you know, several different terms together if you have uh, multiple weights overlaying that, sh that should uh, com be combined to form this, this final index of value. So if you've done that, this is what it might look like. Um, there's just the aggregation of nitrogen reduction per hectare at the pixel level up to the spatial decision unit. In this case, it's unweighted by any service sheds. Um, and here on, on the right, it has a, a service sheds applied where it's uh, reflecting that proportion of the population that's drinking untreated surface water. And it's clearly the areas of value have shifted around a little bit as a result of the, applying the weighting process. Um, once the pre-processing is done, what it will do is generate these, the set of tables on your, in, the, in the workspace corresponding to each of the different activities that you've provided data for. Um, so you can see the summary of nitrogen export and phosphorus export or uh, whatever else you run by the spatial decision unit ID. Um, so this can be joined back to a spatial decision unit shapefile to do this visualization if you want to, for example. So the next step, um, I guess the final step, is to do the optimization itself. So here you would check the do optimization box and set up all of the different uh, components that describe the analysis you want to perform. And so thinking about this mathematically, um, root is essentially a, a, a wrapper around uh, an integer and linear programming solver. Um, so if you, if you know what it is, now you know what root does. Um, and so what it's basically going to do for you is focus on um, this decision variable. So X of IA is the fraction of an SDUI that's going to convert to this activity A. And it's taking into account this 
um, the marginal value map, which is that value of a, to a service S of, of each of the activities in each place, and then a weight that gets assigned to service S um, for a particular iteration of the analysis. And it's by changing the W S's that we'll be able to generate trade-off curves, um, taking into account uh, all of the different objectives that, we're, that we might be looking at. So you, you don't actually have to know what's going on in this e equation to run root though. Um, what you do instead is create um, another table. So this is a representative of another CSV um, on your computer. And what you do is you enter as the headers, the names of the objectives that you're interested in optimizing. And you can say min or max based on whether you'd prefer larger or smaller values for those objectives. So for cost, you probably put min or for carbon sequestration, you would put max. Um, and if you do this min max style, it will do um, well, as many runs as you ask it to do and will assign uh, random weight values to each of the objectives. And that way it'll kind of sample the trade-off curve. Um, alternatively, you can put in a bunch of different uh, rows and assign explicit weights to each of the different objectives. Um, sometimes you might want to do that to use a certain, like a, people call it a space filling sampling, um, or you might have want to be considering particular prices. Uh, so you could use uh, expected dollar values as weights here. Uh, then finally, you can specify what's called in, in um, optimization constraints, or in root, we call them targets. Um, and these are various things where you can say uh, the total amount of area that you want to apply to each of the different activities, or maximum cost, or maybe there are, uh, you only want to consider solutions that achieve a certain amount of improvement to a particular service. So you, you again, create another uh, table, you you can put the name of the objective or the value that you want to apply a constraint to, and then constraints can either be less than, equal to, or greater. So you put that in the constraint type column, and then the, the value. So in this case, we're going to restore, this would be 20,000 hectares of restoration, the cost of less than a million, and we need the nitrate drinking water reduction to be greater than 10, um, whatever 10 means in this context. And then, so what Root will, will do then after you provide that information is generate um, uh, a what range of points. Each point corresponds to a particular combination of, of uh, weight values on the different objectives and specifies a, a particular allocation of, in this case, a restoration activity um, to the different spatial decision units. So each point here has a corresponding map that goes with it. Um, and then one of the outcomes that we want to look at is what we call the agreement map. And so what the agreement map does is it sums across all of the points that were generated the number of times that each spatial decision unit was selected. So what this is telling us is that these, uh, the very dark ones were chosen nearly 100% of the time. So in those cases, it didn't matter whether we wanted to prioritize objective one versus objective two we still want to make that choice. Um, so that means that we don't, we don't really need to consider uh, the social or the decision-making preference when, when we're trying to decide whether operating in those, uh, the dark hexes makes sense. And similarly, the, the ones that are white were chosen 0% of the time. So it didn't matter which objective we want to prioritize. They're never the right choice. Um, and so that leaves the ones that are, are in an intermediate shade those are the ones where the preferences between the objectives are sort of driving whether or not that area was selected. Um, and so this analysis is a way of seeing both the, the range of possibilities and also uh, assessing uh, what we sometimes call the, the preference robustness of the different decisions and to categorize it into the, the ones that are sort of preference indifferent and where we, maybe the, the decision needs to be made based on other factors at this point. 
Um, just wanted to highlight one little bit more complicated example. Um, the previous examples have only considered two different, different objectives and one restoration activity. We've done another analysis in, in uh, this time in Colombia, was focusing on uh, source watersheds for large cities. And here we were looking at four, uh, four different actions that could be implemented in each spatial decision unit. And there were different intensities of um, restoration or agricultural management. And here the optimization wasn't focused on the trade-off curve, but it was to try to find a least cost way of allocating those activities so that we got at least a 10% improvement in two water quality metrics, um, carbon sequestration, and maintained water yield. And this kind of analysis, um, in this case, we found that by uh, putting all of those different objectives into the same optimization, it cost 13 to 95% less than doing four separate one at a time um, allocations and la then layering those solutions on top of each other. So this is highlighting another value of, of an optimization approach um, is that it can uh, find these ways to coordinate between different activities very effectively. Um, so this is just to, to show, show an example where the, the decision framing is a little bit more complicated. Um, and I wanted to wrap up with one more example that hasn't been taken all the way through a root analysis, uh, but is sort of getting set up for it and does reflect um, a marine setting. So this is a, a project where we've been doing um, sort of near shore restoration analysis to protect uh, habitat in the Gulf of, Gulf of Mexico. Um, this project was led by Katie Arkema, another uh, net capper. And the, the context was um, doing restoration uh, after the Deepwater Horizon explosion. And so then the, the question was where um, on the, the seascape should these different restoration activities like of seagrass and oysters and wetlands take place um, in order to provide a suite of benefits to so I'm getting oh. that's just me sending it. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I was afraid that that was the we can't hear you anymore chat. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, good. Thanks. Uh, close it. Okay. So we use basically the same approach to answer this question as we did in the Costa Rica. The context is just a little bit different. Um, we're going to think about adding a protecting habitat. Um, so adding like restoring and then think about where there are vulnerable people who would be uh, protected by that and identify the priority areas. Um, so here, you know, thinking it back to the way a route worked, the first step was identifying um, an activity mask, which defines where an activity could take place. It's a potential sites we want to analyze. Um, for a restoration project, that means identifying the areas where that are suitable for a particular type of habitat. So this is an example of what went into calculating um, suitability for marsh restoration. And we also considered suitable areas for oysters, uh, and seagrass, and then wetlands or marshes. But we have, we had suitability layers or, or activity rasters um, for each of these different uh, restoration types. And one of the services that we looked at was coastal exposure or, or the reduction, coastal protection. Um, and this is the, the INVEST model that looks at various, uh, this is various geomorphology factors and in combination with the habitat to estimate how uh, the addition of new habitat will protect certain areas or each area along the shoreline um, from storm surges. So it uses a, an indexed approach combining all of these different factors. And so we're gonna look at the change in that hazard index as a function of potential restoration activities. And thinking also, going back to the, the ecosystem services framing, we also wanna 
think about uh, who are the people that are being impacted and what would be the value to them of these restoration activities. Um, for this project, we used the social vulnerability index and um, the number of people living in different areas. So this is our, our service shed um, or spatial waiting map that we'll be applying. And so what we did here is, is to analyze again at the spatial decision unit scale, which in this case were these fairly large hexagons, um, what will be the change in that coastal vulnerability index as a function of restoring um, what's shown here as oysters in each of those different areas. Um, on the top is showing the, the prioritization, just the, um, the biophysical value, and the bottom shows the, the index value after the uh, the biophysical has been multiplied by the, the service shed weighting, so the vulnerability index. Um, and it's pretty clear that the areas of importance change quite a bit based on where there are people that will be benefited by uh, this activity. So one kind of analysis that we can, we can do um, using this data is to think about um, what's the benefit that we can achieve with and without that spatial targeting based on the, the vulnerability index. And the, the arrow goes under the picture, right, there we go. Um, so for just focusing on this map or this curve, the the area of restoration that we've achieved um, and the y-axis is the benefit, so the reduction in coastal exposure and based on the, the the weighted value that's reflecting uh, location of people. And we can see that by using the, the targeting information, the service sheds, we're able to get twice the benefit or, or requires twice the area to get to a thousand if we um, ignore the targeting when we're doing the allocation versus when we did the targeting based on just the allocation, uh, based on the prioritizations. So this analysis wasn't done in root, but it, it essentially could have been um, if we provided the, the spatial decision units as tables in the, the UI. Um, just wanted to highlight two other things before opening up to questions. Um, the way the way root works as a sort of self-contained units is the spatial units or spatial inputs go through the pre-processing module that creates those summary tables that I showed. Um, and then those go to the optimizer. Um, it's also possible for the user to do the pre-processing step and then do some additional metrics or processing um, on the, the, the summary tables before sending them to the optimizer. So you could do a particular normalization function uh, across the, the, like the per SDU things. Um, root combined, when it does the service shed by uh, biophysical, combinations, it multiplies them. If you wanted to apply a different function, like add a few things together before multiplying, you could do that as part of this additional step. Or you could add in other variables like cost that maybe didn't have spatial data associated um, or weren't derived from spatial data, but were just on a per area or per project level. You could add that also. So there's this opportunity here to, to do a little bit more uh, with the data before the optimization. And I uh, just wanted to highlight um, as an example of a slightly more complex optimization that you could do. Um, the, the spatial decision units are, are not going to have, you know, here, here's an example of spatial decision unit and the nitrogen loading associated with some, uh, some activity. If you use service sheds or waiting maps that corresponded to different regions, so maybe different subwatersheds, there were just ones and zeros. When those are combined with the nitrogen loading, you can get nitrogen loading per subwatershed as separate columns. And then you could set reduction, nitrogen reduction targets at the subwatershed level. Um, so there are, a lot of, there are a lot of different ways to use um, spatial weights in combination with the biophysical values to break things across different regions or break things across different activity types to answer more uh, detailed and complicated questions. Um, so if you, you know, if you have experience with linear programming and integer programming, um, 
you know, you're able to put together very, very complicated kinds of analyses. Root won't let you do the most complicated of those, but there are ways to add in a lot of the interactions that you would want to be able to in a, in a traditional like by code optimization framework. Um, so that's to highlight that. Um, and then I think the, the final thing to, to mention, um, visualization gets hard with more and more objectives. And this is of course not unique to the optimization approach. This is common across all sort of multi-criteria, multi-objective analyses. Um, but the way that we approach these issues are uh, by using agreement maps uh, to see you know, across all of the different outcomes, what, what are the solutions that seem to make sense. Um, in a more dynamic or interactive setting, these things called parallel coordinates plots can be really helpful. Um, and then of course, you know, combinations of scatter plots together and other kinds of more traditional multi-criteria uh, visualizations can be good too. But this is, I think one of the frontiers for further development is building in some of these uh, more data interactive uh, kinds of outputs as part of root. Uh, but that will be for the future. Uh, so thank you. Um, I think we've got yeah plenty of time for questions now if, if people have them. Um, here's my email. Feel free to email me um, about any, any questions or interest in talking about ways that root could be applied. Um, I have a, a link here and it probably got sent out. Um, if you provide your name and email there, I'll add you to a list where um, I'll just notify you when Root is updated. So it's con continually under development. We're adding new features. Um, here are some links to the Natural Capital Project software. And there's Invest. Excellent. Thank you, Peter. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know how you can ask questions. You can raise your virtual hand and be unmuted. And Allison uh, Glessner, I see that you have, and, and as soon as I get done with my spiel right now, uh, we'll go to you. Um, and also you can type the questions into the chat or the question and answer panels, and then we can, uh, Peter can answer them. Uh, but excellent, this, this is great to learn more about. I, don't, I have a couple of questions too, but um, let's see. Okay, Allison's hand went down, but I, I, my questions were, what sort of, sort of technical uh, chops do you need to be able to do this? And I'm just sort of thinking of lower capacity organizations uh, that don't have a, a lot of uh, GIS staff. Yeah, I think the, the hardest part um, of using Root is getting those first, um, maps that show the potential benefit of a different activity. Um, and that, that's going to require running some sort of ecosystem service model or other kind of biophysical model. Um, Root doesn't do that part for you. It, it's a way of taking that information and then turning it into different uh, optimization results. So it's, yeah, uh, that, that's always going to require some reasonably high level of capacity. Um, okay. But we do often training, offer training on all of those models. So. Okay, and that if you were interested in those, you'd go to the, the naturalcapitalproject.org slash invest? Yep. Okay. Exactly. Okay, great. And I was also wondering in terms of data availability for some of these analysis, like, how freely available is appropriate are appropriate data at what scale and like maybe answer separately for the U S versus worldwide. Uh, yeah. For, yeah. I mean the different analyses use different data, but yep. just curious. So invest has been run globally. Um, so that it is possible to run it for basically anywhere. Um, of course the, you know, better data availability means better modern model certainty. Um, so that's, you know, in the U.S., you're going to be able to get better monitoring data, and particularly on the terrestrial side that I'm familiar with. There's you know, huge amounts of data that make it much easier to parameterize very complicated models in the U.S., and that's not the case elsewhere. Um, one of the, the features that's um, 
coming in route is sort of an uncertainty analysis that will, I'm not sure that it will allow you to assess parametric uncertainty in the models, but it, it does tell you um, whether an agreement map is sort of approaching a stable uh, distribution. And so that's something that you could, could use to assess, you know, running the models with the, whatever parameters you think are, are the best available and then changing those a little bit um, to do a sensitivity analysis and then combining those into uh, an agreement map that is also, you know, it's not just uncertainty about the preferences, but it's also the more underlying uncertainty in the data availability. So that, that'd be my answer for how to build that into the approach. Okay. All right. Thank you, Peter. All right. We have a bunch of questions. Let's see if coming from attendees. Is there a way to tie the root optimization tool to the neat set of tools available through iTree Hydro or their suite of tools? Um, I don't know. Sorry, I'm not familiar with those tools. <laughs> Good enough. Um, uh, I will, I will, um, there is, so root is based on a, a Python code that I wrote. Um, and at some point fairly soon that code will be available uh, open source also. So somebody who has some, some Python jobs could pretty easily integrate the, the optimization part of root uh, with any other tool. Okay. All right. Thank you, Peter. Um, and Brian, if you wanted to follow up, maybe get in touch with uh, Peter offline. Uh, let's see. Um, what's the similarity with MarkSan, the software for conservation planning globally, um, or any advantages over it? That's a very good question. Um, I think the one of they're they're very similar, um, maybe more similar than different. Um, I think the, the two biggest differences, one is just in the, the framing. Um, the way we've set root up is designed particularly to think about um, you know, biophysical changes and corresponding service sheds. So it makes that analysis flow very, very natural. Um, so when you're thinking about ecosystem services and have that, those two types of data that you're thinking about, root will just be easy to use. Um, it's also focused very much on this idea of doing um, many different optimization analyses with the same set of data and looking at uh, consistency across those, so the, the trade-off curves and the agreement maps. Um, so it's designed to make that an easy part of the analysis. Um, currently, I'm Pretty sure that the MarkSan tool does not use uh, integer or linear programming. Um, I say currently because I know that they're they're planning on doing that pretty soon. Um, but the integer linear programming uh, in the optimization world is a very it it gives you what's called an exact optimization, which means you you know in some sense that you found the best possible result. Um, and a lot of the other optimization tools that are out there use um, sort of meta, meta heuristics or approximate optimizations where they use uh, some sort of stochastic process to find a good solution that is not always the best solution. Um, so that's, that's another advantage of Root. Um, again, Markzian, uh, there's a new R package called Prioritizer, which does a lot of the same analyses that Markzian does, but uh, using an integer um, linear programming uh, approach. And I, th I think that there are, I obviously don't want to promise for them, but I think that they intend to merge that with MarkSan, at which point MarkSan would also have that same, uh, same strength. Okay, cool. Thank you, Peter. Um, is there an assumption that the effects of a given activity are homogenous across locations in the study area? Or maybe this is hashed out in invest before you get to root. Yep, it's hashed out in invest before you get to root. Um, so those, those benefit, let me uh, go back to. This map. So it's not totally obvious in this slide, 
um, but there's a, a pretty big range in the, the pixel level benefit, in this case, phosphorus reduction for the activity that's being mapped. And same thing for nitrogen reduction. So using INVEST, you have, you know, at whatever resolution of that you're modeling, which is probably you know, 30 meter pixels are pretty typical. You have an estimate of the, the benefit that you would get in that pixel. Um, one of the reasons that we don't optimize at the pixel level, aside from it being uh, computationally much more challenging, um, is that there's a lot of uncertainty in the model results at that very small scale. So aggregating up to these larger spatial decision units um, is more reflective of the, the efficacy of, of each of these activities um, at, at, a, at the relevant scale while still preserving the fact that some areas are going to be uh, more beneficial than others. Okay, thank you, Peter. Yeah. Um, let's see, can root be used on small scale areas such as large properties or individual watersheds? I would say individual watersheds, yes. Um, we've done that before um, in like, agricultural management plans. Um, properties is probably getting too small. I guess it depends on the models that you have to estimate the, the changes in these services um, at, at very small scale. I wouldn't think of INVEST as giving you uh, reliable results at you know, very small scales. So I'd, I'd, I would want to think carefully about um, the reliability of you know, getting back to the spatial variation question, whether your model is being accurate in the spatial variation across a small property. But okay, uh, and let me just, I will. Okay, please. Yeah, I'll just zip down to show a slide that's from something else. Um, so this is, a, uh, this is an example of us using root in a, 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 say a much more complicated case where we had, was it 12 different potential agricultural transitions? And we're looking at where those can be allocated to reduce uh, different water quality impairments. Um, and this is in a watershed in Iowa. So this, is, this would be you know, an another one of the typical cases that this analysis has been designed for. Um, but it's definitely thinking about, yeah, watershed scale planning. Okay. And I'm going to read you two questions, and you can see if you want to add anything to your previous response relative okay. to these questions. Uh, what is the minimum SDU size advisable, and why not use SDUs the same size as pixels? Um, so the minimum, there's, there's sort of two things that go into, and probably three things that go into answering that question. Um, one of the big challenges is just going to be computational. Um, the, the solvers that are used to do the optimizations can't handle more than a certain number of optimization units. Um, so partly you just have to start at a larger SDU size and work your way down to smaller ones and see where the computer stops being able to do it. Um, there is, you know, in order to, to make this uh, program free and open source, we are using uh, open source solvers. There is a commercial solver called Gorobi um, and another one called Cplex, but Gorobi is the one that I'm familiar with that can solve really, really massive optimizations and might be able to do something that is equivalent to um, pixel level optimization. Um, so I guess it's sort of on our future development plan to be able to connect root to Gorobi for users who have a license, in which case maybe that the computational part wouldn't be a real constraint. Um, but I think again, the, the, the two major issues are that a lot of the models, the very small scale resolution is you know, just sensitive to funny things like DEM routing algorithms um, or you know, remote sensed satellite data, there's uncertainty in the boundaries of different land use categories. So it just doesn't, 
you know, unless you've done a lot of work to really work out the uncertainties in the input data, uh, the pixel level, pixel scale optimization is just reflecting um, noise in the, in the input data. So it doesn't, I don't, I don't think it makes sense to do the optimizations at that scale. Um, another sort of uh, complication, or I guess it's a simplification that we made in root in order to make it general is in the, the linear programming framing of it. And so it doesn't, the changes that you make in one area don't affect the value of potential changes you might make in another area. So if you're thinking about um, putting a buffer around a stream, the first 10 meters makes of restoration makes a big difference. And the, an additional 10 meters after that maybe makes much less of a difference given that the first 10 meters have been restored, but there is some interaction in how effective each of those steps is. Uh, root doesn't capture that kind of spatial independence. Um, it just assumes that each, each action is independent of the others. And I think that that is probably more, that, a, that a assumption makes more sense at larger scales. Um, because a lot of these interactions are very local. But if you try to do the optimization at a, at a very small scale, um, you might want to use a different approach that uh, captures more of those direct point-to-point -point interactions. OK, thank you, Peter. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Can you explain a, a bit about how to read un slash understand the parallel coordinate plot? Yeah, um, it is much more interesting to see it done dynamically, uh, but I'll show you how it works here. Um, so each of the different vertical lines represents one of the objectives. So here's, it's like the sediment going into hydropower catchments, just total reduction in sediment export. Um, here's a case where the benefit to wetlands was identical. Um, so that's, that's what all the vertical lines are. Each of the horizontal connecting lines represents a single solution or a landscape in this case. So you can see, you know, how the, the scores across each of the different objectives for if you were able to trace just a single line across all of them. Um, you can see all the scores that it's getting for each of the different objectives you're looking at. Um, the thing that's useful about parallel coordinates plots when you're able to use them interactively is that you can do this brushing thing where you can highlight areas on each of the axes that you think are like acceptable for that objective. And then it, it subsets only the, the lines that pass through that area. So this, in this picture, I've said, um, you know, I need to get this level of nitrogen export reduction and this level of sediment export reduction. And now it's highlighting all of the, uh, essentially all of the landscapes that we generated through the optimization that meet those uh, criteria, you know, and then we could you know, apply it further narrow the selection by brushing over um, the acceptable regions for the different axes. Um, and then, you know, based on, based on those, we could go back and look at all of the solutions that we highlight and, and regenerate an agreement map that's built just on that smaller subset rather than on the entire frontier. Okay, thank you, Peter. Do you have a few extra minutes? We, we keep getting good questions. Yeah. Okay, um, all right. And then while we're on this page, I, I did wanna ask a sort of a question that's been out there. For the results shown in agreement maps, where color was used to indicate always chosen solutions, strong performance in both objectives or never chosen solutions, poor performance in both objectives. How does this relate back to your Pareto optimal trade-off curve? Wouldn't these never chosen sites be dominated, uh, i.e. not Pareto optimal? What optimization solver did you use? Was it available in Python? So the, let's see, let me go back to. Yeah, I think that's about this one this, is the best. Yeah, this is the one to show. Okay. Um, so the, the, what the agreement app is, well, so each of these points on the Pareto frontier, um, there's a, a landscape 
that it corresponds with that has a particular pattern of selecting or not selecting each of the spatial decision units. So let's just say there's 50 points in here. Um, we can, that means that there's 50 separate landscapes. So each spatial decision unit has been selected or not, or, well, been selected up to 50 times across all of these different, all of, all of the Pareto optimal curves or solutions. So what they, that's what the agreement map is showing um, is the, the number of times on all of these different points that it, it was selected. So the interpretation of the, the zeros would be that these are points that if you did select them, it would put that landscape somewhere inside the Pareto frontier. So that would be a, a suboptimal landscape. And it means that all of, of, of all of the landscapes that were sampled, all of the Pareto optimal ones decided not to go to any of these, um, the white ones. Um, and they all went to the, the blue ones. So I hope that clarifies that. Um, the solvers that were used, um, so there's, there are a couple of libraries in Python that are really useful for um, setting up linear programming problems or integer programming problems. There's one called Pulp, uh, which is Python something linear programming. Um, and then there's one called CVX Pi and an associated CVX opt. And I think the current version of root uses CVX Pi to configure the linear programming problem. And then that, that can call a number of different solvers. Um, so there's like GLPK and Ecos and then Garobi um, if you're using it through the code interface. But there's generally a, like a, a separation between the, the Python module that makes it really easy to write the program the, or the problem as though you're doing math and then the, the, the separate library that actually does the solution. But Pulp and CVXPy are both really usable. Um, and Garobi has its own uh, Python API that's also really, really nice to use. So check okay. any of those out. Okay, great. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Uh, we'll go a little less technical now. Do you have an example of a presentation that you can share that was made to non-technical persons, such as uh, government officials, to convince decision makers to allocate resources to the optimization exercises? I think this would be very useful in making the case for prior to prioritization slash optimization of ecosystem benefits for coastal resilience in the Eastern Caribbean, but I know that I need to build buy-in. Um, that is a great question. I keep thinking someone should write that paper. Um, I don't know if you send me your email address, I will try to find one, um, or a, a paper or something. Um, I know <laughs> in Costa Rica, the, the, our IUCN representative presented all of this stuff to the environmental minister and he, the quote that he gave us back was that she said that she felt like she'd been driving a Camry, but after getting all of this, she felt like she had a Maserati. So. Well, that's exciting. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess hopefully the results sell themselves, but yeah, it's hard to do it if you don't have the, the capacity up front. Um, but yeah, I'd love to try to find what, what whatever, what would be appropriate. Okay. But nothing okay. off the top of my head. Okay. All right. Well, Patricia is still on, so hopefully she heard that. Um, okay. And another question, as opposed to restoration, have you applied root as a way to estimate costs avoided, uh, in parentheses, benefits, through early intervention or some form of a protection strategy? Yeah, great question. Um, we have the, it's basically this, the same approach. So you do you know, rather than a marginal value that's a benefit, you have a marginal value that's a loss. Um, and you, the, the part that gets trickier is that you have to, you know, model what would be the, the counterfactual land use that you'd be moving to, like what sort of development is it agriculture? Is it like cropland? Would it be pasture? Would it be urban development? Um, obviously in a marine setting, those would be different, um, but whatever they would be, 
So in order to get that marginal benefit map, you have to be specific about that transition. Um, and maybe it's probabilistic. Uh, and then the other thing you have to think about is what, how does that risk of development vary across space? So there are some areas that could be very damaging if they were to um, transition, but for various reasons, maybe very unlikely to, to do so. And there might be areas that you know, have more intermediate value or loss uh, or damages, but are very likely to transition. Um, so some sort of risk of development or, or risk of transit la uh, transition layer is also important to have. Um, and in the root framework, you could use that like uh, a service as part of the service shed layer. So you have the, the ecosystem service raster, or marginal value raster, that'd be the damages associated with the transition and multiply that with the service shed and then also multiply it with this probability of a transition occurring. Um, and then you essentially do the same analysis, you know, to give you the prioritization for protection. You still there? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I've already asked you the question uh, oh, I didn't hear while, I was, while I was on mute. Um, yeah, two, two more questions, ho hopefully quick. Could SDUs be overlapping? Um, could they be overlapping? Currently, no. Um, but I was just thinking about that actually while I was putting this talk together um, that in a marine setting the probably SDU overlapping would be important. Um, I know that it was for the analysis we did in the Gulf, like the different habitat restoration types could really be sort of simultaneous. Um, so that is in the code you, if you, if you use the Python module, um, you're able to say that certain uh, activity types in an SDU could be sort of non-exclusive. So you could have multiple choices made for the same SDU. And that would be similar to overlapping SDUs. Um, but yeah, currently through the UI, you can't. Okay. And has root been used as part of MCDA, um, which I believe is multi-criteria decision analysis, or in any optimizing for climate change resilience? Um, definitely no on the second one that I'm aware of. Um, and I think not officially on the, on the first one. Um, IUCN and some of their other engagements has done MCDAs. And I, I guess I just don't, I know that they were in some of the same countries that we were doing root. I don't know if they got combined. So I don't have an example to share about that. Okay. Okay, Peter, thank you so much uh, for presenting. Obviously a lot of interest and thank you so much for staying late to answer questions. And thank you to everyone who's still on for uh, your, your interest in asking great questions. So um, yes, thank you again. We really appreciate you coming on and, and uh, I hope everyone has a, a wonderful rest of your day. Yeah, thanks everybody here. You can take a last screenshot to have all the info. Okay, Otherwise, yeah, <laughs> perfect. All right, bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. All right.